Hello everybody, my name is Katie. I work for the River Raisin Watershed Council and today we are at Sterling State Park. This is a really special park that's in our watershed. It's actually the end of the River Raisin. We call that the mouth of the river where it flows out into a bay or an ocean or lake and in our case the river goes out into Lake Erie. So as you'll see we're going to be talking about some really interesting stuff. We're going to be talking about migratory birds and the place that we're in, a wetland area. And we'll kind of go over why each depends on each other. So let's go explore our state park and see what we can find. And maybe we'll find a special friend along the way. So as we're walking around the wetland, we come across some of this prairie type stuff here. We've got all kinds of different grasses. We've got this yellow flower that's called goldenrod. And these grasses and flowers are all native to Michigan. And they're really important for wetland areas. Why do you think plants like this would be so important for wetland areas? Type below if you have an answer. Hmm. Let's take a look at some of our other plants while you guys are answering. So prairie plants like this are very important because they trap nutrients that are coming off of urban areas. Uh, places like parking lots, which would be close behind me, trails, sidewalks, uh, things like that have nutrients that run off of them after it rains. Um, same with agricultural fields. So um, prairies are really good at trapping those nutrients so they don't get into our wetlands or our rivers or streams. And that's important because too many nutrients in the water can cause algae blooms. And algae blooms can sometimes be toxic uh, depending on what kind they are. So if we have these plants, that are all behind us, especially next to our wetland areas, they're gonna trap those nutrients um, from getting into our waterways. And while we're walking, we're just gonna take a little tour of our prairie areas so you can see a little more up close what these plants look like. And this would be great if you live by a river or by a wetland, you can plant stuff like this in your yard so that you can help prevent um, contaminants and nutrients from getting into that wetland or river. Oh, hey, Brittany, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm actually here checking to see if I can find any raptors migrating. It's about this time around the end of September, early October, that's peak raptor migration period. I don't see any right now, but it certainly would be a good area to find it because here in Michigan, we're actually one of the peak areas that you'll find large amounts of raptors migrating around this time. It's really, really cool if you happen to see it. You'll see hundreds, sometimes even thousands of raptors, hawks, uh, owls sometimes, but mostly you'll see your falcons and your, your hawks flying overhead. And speaking of, this is actually a really cool book. I love it. Um, I'm still working on my raptor identification and this is a really good book teaching you about what to look for whenever you identify not only raptors, but really any type of bird. So some key spots to look at is always around the eye area. A lot of birds will have markings around their eyes. That's a good spot to look. The crown is a good area. The chest is another area that if you only have about a split second to look at a bird, those are some good areas to look at, as well as along the wing area. So especially with raptors, the best time to identify them is in the air. And so you'll wanna, whenever you identify raptors, you wanna look at the identification of the wings and the tail. Tails, most of them will have some kind of marking on the tail, whether it's a solid color or lines. Same thing with the wings. You'll see lots of different colors, designs, and shapes. Um, 
But yeah, this book is amazing because if you only have a second, look for any kind of markings that identify something versus uh, another. And so you can see here as you look, some have white underneath, some have striping. Versus like here, the American Kestrel, you'll see this black line along the bottom edge of the tail. Those are all things that you'll want to look for whenever you go to identify them. And if you're lucky enough, you'll see them perched on something, in which case you can have even longer to be able to identify them. But this is a great book because it'll teach you, it shows you the pictures, it shows you where you can find them in the relative area, the size, weight, the habitat you'll find them. These are great books. Katie, what are you doing? Oh, hey there. <laughs> I was looking at birds in this wetland area. This is one of the best wetland places in Sterling State Park. As you can see, there's all kinds of wetland plants. We've got some white water lily, pond lily up in front here, and then the bigger plants poking out in the background, those are called American Lotus. And those are really important for all kinds of wetland uh, animals to eat. You'll actually see some different ducks and waterfowl eating some of the seeds and tubers of these plants out there already. And if you look closely, you'll see little white dots. Those are all swans. And usually we'd be excited about seeing swans, but these are an invasive swan called mute swans. They're originally from Europe. And mute swans are really aggressive. They chase off native waterfowl that are supposed to be here, um, eating the tubers and seeds um, as they're migrating through the area. So swans, uh, mute swans like this, we're not a huge fan of, but there are tundra and trumpeter swans that fly through the area that use wetlands just like this to feed themselves and get fueled up to go through uh, back up north or down south. And if you hear behind me, there's some Canadian Canada geese. Those are a common there they are. Those are a common species in wetlands as well. So why are wetlands so important? Well we talked about the food that's provided for all these birds migrating through the area. Um, they have special tubers, especially underwater, that have a lot of fiber, protein, and nutrients that birds need so that they can fly such long distances back to their wintering habitat or their summer habitat. So wetlands are also really important for habitat. Um, different times of the year, uh, birds will breed and actually their chicks will grow up in wetland areas, just like the American coots. Um, that maybe we'll see a little later. Um, so habitat is really important for birds in wetland areas. Food is provided by these wetland areas. And uh, they're a nursery area, not just for birds, but also for all kinds of fish, frogs, turtles, muskrats, even beavers are found here and grow up in areas just like this. Why, would, why do you think that would be? Why would a uh, wetland area be a good nursery area? You can type your comments down below. Hmm. Well, wetland areas are really calm and quiet. If you look out there, there's not a whole lot of waves. There's not a whole lot of current going through this wetland marsh. And that's perfect for babies when they're starting to grow up. Um, it's also got the habitat that they can go under if they're scared. Um, it protects them from predators. And all the plants that are growing in there, are. it makes it hard for predators to get through. So it's just kind of the perfect combination for uh, babies to grow up in. Um, another thing about wetlands is that they're kind of rare. So it's a really important thing to 
uh, protect wetlands as much as we can. And luckily for us, they're protected under law, most of them. But if you want to help protect wetlands, I'm going to show you something we can do. And if we do it safely, that's even better. Like if you have an adult with you, you can pick up garbage that you find. I found this bobber with a lot of fishing line attached to it and a, a really old fishing uh, bait. So this is really dangerous for animals. Um, if they come across this, they can get tangled up in this fishing line and get hurt or die. Um, they can also eat garbage that we accidentally let loose, like plastic bags. So if you see garbage, or if you're out in the park and you're having a picnic, make sure you pick up after yourself and make sure that all of your trash goes in the garbage can. Do you see a different bird, Brittany? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually seeing a pied-billed grebe. Wow. They're a really cute little bird. Again, another bird you'll find on the water. Um, it's out there again it's rather far so you won't be able to see it but this is a pied-billed grebe and what i'm seeing out there is actually it's either a female or a young adult because it lacks the details that you would find on a male so to kind of go into identification a little bit so typically across the board with most birds female birds have they lack extra detail they're less colorful more drab looking um because they need to blend in with their environment to sit on their eggs and protect them. Males usually are more colorful, more vibrant. One, because it's a mating display to get the females more attracted to them. So the more colorful, the more verbal, and more vocal that you can be, attracts more females. And also it helps to attract predators away from the nest and the females. And so typically if you ever see a bird You'll see males and females together, but they actually will sometimes look very different. So, along with all the other waterfowl we've seen in our wetland area, there's another type of bird that loves to use this kind of area to get its food. It's called an osprey. Ospreys are really interesting birds of prey, and they fly up above wetland areas and they have really good vision and they can see a fish from below the surface and they snatch it right up. And they have specialized claws that are just for fishing. Um, so that's one of their adaptations is that they're able to just hold on to that fish and take it up to their nest. And usually they nest um, in trees that are near wetland areas so they're never that far from their food. The same goes for bald eagles, which is one of the favorite birds of the USA. So bald eagles and ospreys and a lot of other birds of prey uh, were almost all extinct. Why do you think that would be? If you have a guess, type it below. There's a few reasons. Um, one of them would be habitat loss, especially for ospreys since they strictly depend on wetland and river habitats. So a lot of our uh, wetland areas were being built up upon um, before we knew the importance of wetlands. So habitat loss is one reason that these birds were almost extinct. But the main reason is because there was a chemical that was used um, for a lot of different reasons, uh, and mostly agriculture, called DDT. And this was a spray that people would use to get rid of bugs. And unfortunately, this DDT, when it was applied on fields, it washed off after rains and went into rivers and streams, which eventually got into our wetland areas where these birds were fishing or hunting and this DDT built up in the fish and other uh, prey items that they were eating and they ate it and it built up in their bodies as well and this affected the thickness of the eggshells um, of these birds so when they laid their eggs the eggshells were so thin and weak because of the chemicals that when they sat on them to get incubated they would actually break 
Hey Brittany, what's that box for? Hi, yeah, so this is a wood duck box. Oh. So wood ducks, we, you see them earlier in the videos, um, but, or later in the videos, and so with the wood duck boxes, um, because there's a loss of habitat for wildlife, quite often we have to build nesting structures for birds, whether it's a nesting box for a wood duck or a platform for an osprey you actually will find a lot of man-made nesting opportunities for birds because we've taken away their habitat. So typically wood ducks will actually nest in dead trees near water and they'll lay their, their eggs in here and the chicks will hop out and fly down into nearby water, which is a really fun video to watch if you ever find it. But yeah, wood duck boxes are really, really cool and those are things that you can do to help the wildlife in the area is by building structures for birds to nest in. Um, as you're out and about walking near places, um, oftentimes birds are not right in your face so you're going to struggle to see them. So it's knowing what habitat to look in for to see certain species, um, food resources, sometimes bird identification. You can listen to sounds to identify their calls, visual, um, there's various ways you can use to identify birds, but whenever you go out looking for birds in any kind of way, things you'll absolutely want to have is a good set of binoculars. Um, honestly, they're so helpful because whenever something's far away, it's hard to be able to identify those little features that you need to to be able to say, oh, this is what this what this is the bird it is versus another, and a good bird book. So depending on your experience levels, you may want a more experienced one like this. This is a really high level experience book. Um, there's also really simple bird books that will actually identify them via color. So you can actually sort through a book by the color that it is, which would be better for beginners. So if you have children or even just a beginner birder, that's a good place to start. But these are good things to have. So out here on the water, you actually you won't be able to see it too well with the camera, but there are American coots out on the water right now. And what's super cool about these, these birds are they have these little flaps on their toes that actually enable them to walk on water, which you can't see on here, but if you looked up a video, you could see them as they walk on the waters. You'll see them walking on plants and other types of things, but American coots are one of my favorite birds. What's really fun is right now a lot of birds don't always migrate and so you'll start seeing some of those ones like blue jays, some woodpeckers don't necessarily migrate, uh, American goldfinches don't migrate, they actually gold, the American goldfinch will actually lose its yellow coloring and turn into this like olive drab color um, in the winter time and so most people think that they migrate but they don't. They're actually still around and they stay all year long. And actually, up in the tree, this dead tree back here, there are a mating pair of northern flickers. And what's really cool about flickers and woodpeckers are you can actually tell when a woodpecker is flying nearby because they have a different flying pattern. So most birds fly pretty straight. You'll see the flapping can be different sometimes, but with flickers and woodpeckers, they do this motion where they'll fly in an upward downward motion as they're going along and so you can always tell from a distance that it's a woodpecker. If you'd like to do more to protect the environment uh, whether it's our wetlands or birds that migrate through our area you can uh, the best thing you can do is teach others what you learn. Um, you just learned a lot from our video but there's a lot more things out there um, and you can visit both of our websites. Um, the River Raisin Watershed Council has a website and a Facebook page and a YouTube page where you can learn all kinds of things about the plants and animals that live in our watershed. And I'll let Brittany explain where she works and what work that she does. Yeah, so I work for River Raisin Institute. We're based here in Monroe. And we also have a YouTube, Facebook, and web page that you can feel free to check out. We have both of our organizations have various volunteer opportunities, educational opportunities, and even just some stewardship opportunities that you can join in on to learn and spread the word about what we're doing to help the environment. 
Thanks for watching.